Revolutionary War and uh, the, the start of our nation uh, from, from the Mayflower uh, all the way to, to the to and just a little bit past the uh, Revolutionary War. On occasions, I will, I will share something from one of our founders that I think are very relevant for us today. So the reason I make mention of this, I, I don't care. And, and if you're not aware, anytime you read the Bible and you read the footnotes at the bottom, you are reading a man's opinion. And, and so you, you can take it for what it is, and hopefully it, you, you, you look at history or, or you look in the Scripture and make sure it's correct. Well, today I'm going to uh, uh, be doing that not from a footnote in the Bible, but a, a, a document from early American history. And over what happened this past week, and I'm, and I'm hearing so much argument going on and the mistakes that were made I mean it was a horrific thing with those kids 19 kids and two adults as they come into that grade school now you know uh, we we hear about the mistakes being made waiting outside for an hour some of these kids probably bled out and died during the during the wait we have to be careful um, and and now you you've got you've got Side, people on both sides this one we need gun reform this one we need to arm our teachers I, 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 I will tell you this much gun reform is not the answer but more guns is neither the answer America has more guns probably than any nation in the world the last time I checked just if you are a registered gun owner, which probably means you are registered carry permit, in the state of Iowa, and Tennessee was, at the time was not very far behind Iowa, Iowa in itself constituted the eighth largest army in the world by the weapons that they would have had. So this tells you how many weapons we have in America. And I am a constitutionalist. I believe in our Second Amendment. Um, you will not get my guns unless you follow the right procedures. And, and I know the right procedures in amending the Constitution. Anything outside of that will be unconstitutional. And, and, um, and I would not abide to that law because it would be unlawful. So today... With, with everything in mind, and I, as I began to think about it, and again, I alluded a little bit to this last week. Uh, little did I know, the, the Lord had placed this on my heart a week before this even happened at the school. And, and it's, it's a letter from Dr. Benjamin Rush, who, in my opinion, is hands down the greatest of our founding fathers. Very few people have heard of him, Hardly anyone would recognize him if they seen a picture of him, uh, or or if you see a picture of the signers. He did sign the Declaration. It, you probably couldn't pick him out because he's just not spoken of uh, in in the history books like Jefferson and Franklin, which by the way are the two deists. It's 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 strange why we know them more than we know anyone else. But, but uh, a, a little bit of who this man was, because the, the title of this, and since it's being recorded, I want to make sure that, that I, 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 I'm clear in, in, in my statements. This is his opinion, Benjamin Rush, and, and the title to this is in def a defense of using the Bible as a school book. Now, Everything that I know about Benjamin Rush, and I've read a lot about him, and, and so I, I, I think that I can say safely that he is understanding, and my understanding of the defense of using the Bible school book would be the same. Not for apologetics. Not for exegesis or, or hermeneutics 
any of these theological terms where it's talking about studying or interpreting the Bible. I am not in favor of putting a Bible in our schools for the purpose of interpretation, simply because the church in itself has a, a big enough problem trying to interpret it on its own. Look at the difference of opinions we have in Christianity. I would be the very one fighting if we're trying to have Bible study as a form of you have a teacher up there expounding because you may have a teacher that's not even a Christian. So I'm, I'm not saying that, but, but what I am saying is the use of a Bible as a school book as they would have learned. Let me grab this. I couldn't find uh, readily available, and I just thought about it while we were going through the worship set. I run over there, but this one I always keep put up away from fingers. This is the first school book in America. This is called the New England Primer. Now, this is an original. It's not original of the 1776, uh, that, that era. This is about a 1860. And, and in this, it's the New England Primer. And it, with, with what, what you would find in here is where they would take the Bible and they learn how to read by reading the Bible. They learn how to spell by using words they find in the Bible. This is how they taught the kids how to read and write. And you could find versions of this as they were older. There were other versions all the way up into the 1920s that would have been used in America. Well, this one right here was somewhere, no doubt this one may have even seen the Civil War since it was produced uh, right before the Civil War. But with everything that's happened in the last week, I'm not hearing anyone and it's say anything about God. Yeah, I've, I've heard the statements, we need to get God back in school. But what does that mean? And, and I may have to take my time a little bit here. What does that mean, putting God back into school? I'm going to tell you, it doesn't mean that we have a prayer service. Because we've prayed enough about this. If we're going to put God back in school, because first of all, let's understand, you can't, you can't legislate holiness, nor can you legislate evil gone or holiness in. It can't happen. And the only way we're going to get God back in this nation is if the people, most importantly, the Christian people, start beginning to understand their Christian obligations first and foremost when it comes to the home, and then we start putting a, 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 a message even in everyone's in their mind of the concept of the Word of God. So what you'll find out with Benjamin Rush is that if, if you, he believed that if you just would read the Word of God, it would have a lasting impression upon you. Now, the, the theological debates, that can, be, that can be left for the leaders of the church. We're not talking about theological debate. Actually, right now, I could care less about theological debate. Do you realize 19 more kids were killed than two adults? And I know probably most people in here do not like CNN. I don't like Fox either, but, but I, I actually watch CNN on, on this... Uh, covering this story, and they've done an outstanding job into making it come home. They, even when they would talk about it at the end of their little segment, they would show three or four kids and give you a little bit of excerpt about the kid and maybe even show you a video of something in that kid's life. They, they, they did an outstanding job of bringing this home, making this, this real. And... I began to think about that, and I thought, you know, Lord, you, you laid this on my heart a week early, but, but I think this would be very relevant for today. So if, if you're going to be a little bit uh, offended, I pray that you're not, 
that I'm just not bringing you a Bible sermon from a Bible topic, but I am going to bring you something from a very good Christian man that was born in, born in uh, 1746 in Pennsylvania. His father died in 1751. He was five years old. His mother, because she wanted her kids to have an education, loaded the kids up and took them to Philadelphia, an education this man got. He, many times, is considered uh, 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 very influential, if not the most uh, important and well-known physician in America. He didn't start, but he helped. He had a part in starting what we know today, just what we got out of the Sunday school movement in America. He was very instrumental in that. Uh, so many things he was involved with. He, he, he even served a, l a small portion of time, I'm not sure what capacity, in the, uh, 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 the, the Continental Army, uh, but he signed the Declaration of Independence, and, and the list goes on and on and on. If, if I remember correctly, by the time he was six years old, he could read the Bible from cover to cover, but the key to this is the man did not become a Christian, according to uh, uh, my remembering history, until he was in his late 20s, if not 30-year-old. See, I can relate there with him. I didn't become a Christian until I was 28 years old, but like Benjamin Rush, I had a life that, was, that God was always a part of. That's the reason when I got saved, I already knew huge portions of the Bible. I didn't understand it, but I knew all the Scriptures, and I, 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 I you, you know, it became part of our life. Well, I remember one particular time, and this wasn't Benjamin Rush, but just to give you a little bit of a, a background of what was going on, but because they would use things like the Bible, I believe it was a fifth grade class had a had a contest of whoever could went, read, memorize the most Bible scripture would receive a buck knife. And um, I forget how many, how many of these kids were quoting scripture after scripture, verse after verse, chapter after chapter. And then here come Webster, and he goes chapter after chapter, book after book. And finally the teacher stopped him and said, okay. You've got this. Guys, can we even quote a chapter? And this is not about being able to memorize the Bible, but I'm going to tell you from growing up in church, not being a Christian, how helpful it was to keep me out of things. I've, I, I, I never had any alcohol. Never touched any drugs. I was never in any trouble. Never went to jail. Part of it was because of the Word of God. The other part was because my dad would kill me. I mean, if, if you got a whipping at school, you got it when you got home. And Benjamin Rush, he is now given, he, he has written this because of the deist and, and some of the anti-religious people are, 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 are really making some pushes throughout America at the known time. And, and so he, he, he wrote this article in why we need to do this. And, and I, I'll touch on this, but in case you don't catch it, he said, if, if we... If we do not do this, if we remain silent on allowing our kids to be able to read the Word of God, we will do more harm in 50 years than the anti-religious people could do in a thousand. And are we not there? We want to bring America back to God. 
We're going to have to definitely start with our kids. And if you're not doing these things with your kids at home, you really need to be asking God, what should I be doing? Because what we're doing today, guys, is not working. So let's go. I don't want to, I don't want to take too much time away from it. And again, his name is Benjamin Rush. The article, and you can get it, it's readily available. I recommend David Barton with Wall Builders. This man does not have to give you his opinion. This man owns the documents. I've held them in my hand. I've held the King James Bible in my hand. I've, I've been to a few things with, uh, where David Barton's been and, and, and had the opportunity to, to hold some of these documents. This is Dr. Benjamin Rush, Defensive Use of the Bible School Book. He wrote this in 1791. And he said, I shall assume the five following propositions. Number one, that Christianity is the only true and perfect religion, and that in proportion as mankind adopt its principles and obey its precepts, they will be wise and happy and that a better knowledge of this religion is to be required by reading the Bible than in any other way, and that the Bible contains more knowledge necessary to man in this present state than any other book in the world, and that knowledge is most durable and religious instruction most useful when imparted early in life, and that the Bible, when not read in schools, is seldom read in any subsequent period of their life. So he goes on to say that he gives arguments in favor of using the Bible. First, he says, in the constitution of the human mind. Now, I don't want you to get lost in the letter. I am very thankful that we have a beginning that we have in America. I am very thankful that we have leaders like Benjamin Rush and so many others that understood they, they, there was not a disconnect like they are today. Today we've lost our identity in Christ of who we are. We've lost who we are in Christ. That's why we can have a, a, a U.S. representative who, when you, you could go to her church or talk to her uh, 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 during off when she's not in, in session and she is anti-abortion but when she gets in Congress she's over here voting for abortion and she does this because of this disconnect of that God that, that we can't mix religion with politics and, and truly, so they, they've learned how to set their, their, their opinion in these areas to the side and do their secular job. But if you're not careful, we do this in our careers. We do this in our schools. How many teachers are teaching things today that they really think they shouldn't be teaching? I mean, we, we've been led to believe not only is this acceptable, but it's okay what we, that we should be doing this. There's a great disconnect. And, and so when I say that we've lost our identity of a Christian, of who we are, this is what I'm talking about. So if we want to get God back in the, in the nation, well, first and foremost, we're going to have to start with our kids, and it's going to have to start back at home. Now, even Benjamin Rush realized, because he used the school, because he realized the home, they were not taking the time, nor did the home have the order in the home that could accomplish this like it could in the school. In other words, you've got so much going on, your kids are running around like a bunch of wild Indians. That's okay. My grandkids run around like a bunch of wild Indians too. But you, but you know, when they go to school, they do not run around like a bunch of wild Indians. And I would be safe to say, the ones of you that homeschool, when you homeschool, you make your kids act different during homeschool hours than you do regular family hours. Just my opinion. I may be wrong. This is where he's getting at on this. So there would, he's saying there would be no better place to start than the schools. Now... Is this going to be easy? Absolutely not. And if you're not careful, you're going to disagree with me, not because I'm wrong, because, but because you do not want to put the work in that this will take. 
the memory of the first faculty which opens in the minds of children of how much consequence then must it be to impress it with the great truths of Christianity before it is preoccupied with the less interesting subject. Now, I want to stop and, and make, say this. This is not my first time doing this. Unfortunately, it's the first time I think I've done it in church. But we have three-star program for Fentress County. Actually, I think Leslie was at the meeting. I was asked to come and speak at a three-star meeting. That's where we have some, some of our elected officials and also our business leaders of the community to come. And I was asked to speak, and this is what I spoke on to, to the leadership there. So this is not my first time doing this, but it is from the pulpit. That I'm, that if, unless I've forgotten it. Number two, there is a peculiar aptitude or ability in the minds of children for religious knowledge. I have constantly found in the first six or seven years of their life more inquisitive upon religious subjects than any others. It would be strange if it were otherwise, for God creates all His means to suit all His ends. So, I've got a little footnote here, so that tells you that's my opinion, that when it comes to uh, reading the kids the Bible or having them to read the Bible at home, that they wouldn't want to do this. So, in my, my, my little footnote that I have not on this copy is... Um, what does kids have to do with it? They make the instructions in your home? I know, because today we live in a world where the, we, we, it's kind of like we've got to sell the kids on this. I am old school. I recognize that. And I'm going to... Uh, but you hang on, because in a minute I'm going to be saying to the parents and to adults, what do we have to do with it? There, there is a pecking order in things. When it comes to the home, the kids are not the one that dictates it, because they're not able to dictate. And I'll tell you what, especially uh, Tracy. Tracy has told us several times she is glad we didn't let her make the decision that we made them for her. Number three, he says the influence of prejudice, and he's talking about here the word prejudice being a strong opinion, is derived from impressions which are made upon the mind in early life. And he goes on, prejudices or strong opinion are of two kinds, truth or lies. It's either truth or it's lies. It's either truth or it's false. There is no in-between. And he goes on to say, in a world where false prejudices do so much mischief, it would discover great weakness not to oppose them by such as are true. I grant that many men re have rejected the prejudices derived from the Bible, but I believe no man ever did so with have been made wiser or better by the early operation of these prejudices upon his mind. He goes on to say, Every just principle that is to be found in the writings of Voltaire, if you're not familiar with Voltaire, he is a philosopher and a writer, an anti-religious philosopher, is borrowed from the Bible. So he said he's borrowed these from the Bible, and the morality of the deists, and the deists, for a short definition of the deists, basically believe, yeah, there is a God, but He doesn't want anything to do with mankind. He's not concerned about the affairs of man. So this is more of what Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson would have been thinking, uh, uh, but, but maybe they even moved more closer to Christianity in the later part of their life. He goes in, uh, uh, the morality of the dish, which has been so much admired and praised, is, I believe, in most cases, the effect of habits produced by early instruction in the principles of Christianity. 
He goes on to say, We are subject by a general law in our natures to what is called a habit. Now, if the study of Scriptures be necessary to our happiness at any time of our life, the sooner we begin to read them, the more we, will, we shall be attached to them. I've been in the class for every week, so I should do it like my instructor's done it this way. Every time he's seen the word shall, he goes, shall. You see that word shall? Shall. I shall. You shall. That means it's, this, this, it's basically you better do it. Shall. So in, in other words, he's saying that, that this is something that, that would be wise if we were to do it. And he goes on to say, Now a knowledge of the contents of the Bible is acquired in school by the aid of the, of the uh, eyes and ears for children after getting their lessons, always to say to them, to their masters or their teachers, in an audible voice. Of course, there is a presumption that this knowledge will be retained much longer than if it had been acquired in any other way. So in case I forget to say what he's talking about here, because I know Benjamin Rush, he is saying, at the point that your child is old enough to read, they need to read it out loud. Now, folks, you can disagree because this is a man's opinion. You can disagree. I, I firmly believe that, that if you put these practices, if you put this to practice, it will produce positive results. If we want to change our nation... We're going to have to change something. I mean, it's going to have to be a radical change. Even, even if everything in you says, well, no, that we don't need to do that, then that's probably the very thing that you need to be doing when it comes to something like this. He goes on, the interesting events and characters recorded and described in the Old and New Testaments are accommodated above all others to seize upon all the faculties of the minds of the children. He says, so the Bible is geared to touch every aspect of our senses. It's going to affect them. The understanding, the memory, the imagination, the passions, and the moral powers are all occasionally addressed by the various incidents which are contained in those divine books, insomuch that not to be delighted with them is to be devoid of every principle of pleasure that exists in a sound mind. And there is a native love of truth in the human mind. He, he describes it this way, that the Bible contains more truth than any other book in the world. So true is a testimony that it bears of God in His works of creation, His providence, and His redemption. That is why it is called the Word of Truth itself. This is why we call any way in America, and now we've taught the world, we pick this up. It's, it's synonymous not only with the Bible, but the word of truth. See, Benjamin Rush is just backing this up. This is the word of truth. Also, Benjamin Rush uh, uh, was uh, uh, held, uh, uh, started a group in, in, in Philadelphia, the, the abolition against slavery, and I forget how many slaves... He was responsible in freeing. He started the Young Ladies Society in Philadelphia. This man uh, was just a, a, a just a, it's unreal of the marks in so many areas that he, he, uh, he entered Princeton College at the age of either 13 or 14 as a junior in the junior class. And he graduated Princeton College the next year. This, this was a very, very intellectual man. But, but you can find so many, so many people during that era of time. There is a wonderful property in the memory which enables it in old age to recover the knowledge it had required in the early life 
after it had been apparently forgotten for 40 or 50 years. Of how much consequence must it be to fill the mind with that species of knowledge in childhood and youth, which when recalled in the decline of life will support the soul under the infirmities of age and soothe the avenues of approaching death. The Bible is the only book which is capable of affording this support to old age. And it is for this reason that we find it resorted to so much, with so much diligence and pleasure by such old people as have it read in their early life. The kind of work I've done, I would be safe to say there's very few people that attend church here that's seen as much, probably no more, death than I have seen over my life. And actually experienced people take their last breath. I was fortunate, even though we had state mandates that religious material was not allowed anywhere near these, these ambulances that I drove for 25 plus years, that, that I obtained permission from my boss to, to have these with the with the understanding upon state inspection, I would remove them, which I did so gladly. And watching these people, these old people that were on death's door, and the first thing I would do before I did any medical treatment, the first thing is I'd hand them a Bible. And they would take that Bible and they would cradle that like I had given them a million dollars. Every, I'm sure everything went soaring back through their mind of all the reading and the hearing of God's Word throughout their life and would bring such, such comfort. He says, In my second argument in favor of use of the Bible in schools is founded upon an implied command of God and upon the practice of several of the wisest nations in the world, America being one of them, with, with righteousness exalts a, nature, a nation, but a sin is a reproach to its people. In the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, this now as I begin to read the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, as I told you, when it comes to having your kids to read the Bible, it doesn't matter if they want to or not. Now, when we get to Deuteronomy, whether you want to do it or not, if you are a blood-bought, born-again child of God, it doesn't matter whether you think it's the right thing or not. Obviously, the Lord will let you do whatever you want to do. He will give you that. He let an 18-year-old boy walk into a, a school. And, and granted, there's supposed to have been a, an officer there, but he was gone. But before we crucify him how many of you are supposed to have been somewhere on your job and you wasn't yeah there was a school door left open how many of you have left things open that you shouldn't have i grew up boy you born on a hill shut that door i mean we had a lady used to go to church here she called me one day said pastor i forgot and left my door open today and now i've got a snake in my house can you come and help me get the snake out of my house we realize this was a horrific thing that happened. But folks, I'm telling you, there is nothing that we're going to legislate that's going to change this. You, could, you, can, you can put guns in the hands of people at school. Maybe we need to do that. I'm not saying we don't. But do you think that, they're, they're, that they're, it's going to stop the evil from happening? Absolutely not. We're going to have to understand it, that there's going to have to be some changes made, and it's got to start right here with us. And see, in the, in the, the Scripture, in the 6th chapter of Deuteronomy, I believe right along the first verse is probably where this is going to start. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. Then he says, And you shall teach them diligently to your children. 
Uh, there ought to be a shall there. Thou shall teach them to your children. And thou shalt, boy, it is here, the next one, and thou shalt talk of them when you sit us in your house. And you shall talk about them when you walk by the way. And you shall talk about them when you lay down. And you shall talk about it when you rise up. This is from the book of Deuteronomy. This is what we are supposed to be doing. Our kids, you, you remember it talked about, write them on the, 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 the fontlets or whatever you call the, the scriptures on them, where, they can, where they're always accessible. He goes on, I wish to be excused for repeating here that if the Bible did not convey a single direction for the attainment for of future happiness, it should be read in schools in preference to all other books from its containing the greatest portion of that, of that kind of knowledge which is calculated to produce private and public temporal happiness. And he goes on to say, And I shall proceed to answer some of the objections which have been made to use of the Bible's school book. And remember, all that he's talking about, all that I'm conveying, is reading the Word of God. I'm not talking about explaining. If you want to explain to your kids, that's fine. This, this is not a, 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 an apologetics class. This is just allowing, it's teaching your kids how to read by reading the Bible. He says, we are told that the fam familiar use of the Bible in our schools has a tendency to lessen its due reference, its reverence for it. This objection by proving too much proves nothing at all. If familiarity lessens respect for divine things, then all these precepts of our religion, which enjoy the daily or weekly worship of the deity, are in proper. He said, if you believe that it will lessen the, the, the seriousness of the Bible, then we need to stop coming together. He said, but where will the Bible be read by young people with more reverence than in a school? Not in most private families. For I believe there are few parents who preserve so much order in their houses as is kept up in our common English schools. We are told that there are many passages in the Old Testament that are improper to be read by children, and that the greatest part of it is no way interesting to mankind other than the present dispensation of the gospel. He says, I deny that any of the books of the Old Testament are not interesting to mankind under the gospel dispensation. Most of the characters, the events, the ceremonies mentioned in them are personal, providential, or instituted types of the Messiah, all of which have been or yet remain to be fulfilled by Christ. It is from ignorance or neglect of these types that we have so many deities in Christonum. Let us not be wiser than our Maker. If moral precepts alone could have reformed mankind, the mission of the Son of God into the world would have been unnecessary. He came to promulgate a system of doctrines as well as a system of morals. See what he's saying. If you just allow your kid to read it, it will instill some morals into them. Does that not make sense? Who in here that's not been through school that does not know how does not know how to do math? Everybody knows one plus one, two plus two, three. We we probably even know our times table. This week, unfortunately, I've been taxed with a little bit of geometry and algebra. But but who in us does? Do, do you know why we know? Our, our math and our times tables and our alphabet because we were taught it we had to say these things in school so it, it just makes sense that if we say these things it's going to have an effect Benjamin Franklin even contested to the fact that where 
he would see the fiery preaching or the, 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 the songs, the Christian songs being sung in the homes that he noticed that even the homes had better morals than those that did not participate. You want to turn your nation around? You want to put America, God back in America? Do you? It's going to take more than what's been happening. If you don't know what you're to do, then you must be dedicated to do this. Pray until you do. And I don't I'm not talking about a little fifteen minute prayer. I mean basically you're gonna you're gonna make a covenant with God. I'm not gonna stop praying until I do. I'm not gonna leave you alone on this, Lord, until I know what I must do. Or we continue life and watch America go by the wayside. And folks I'm not talking about America, the land of prosperous when it comes to money. Folks, we, we have had a famine in America for many decades, several years. A famine of God's Word. America as far as the, the greatness that is experienced, I, I, I really don't care about that. I want to see God back in America. Even if that means we, we see mighty moves of God, but yet our government and our country is not prospering. I don't care if the country is going to prosper or not. I'm concerned that we're not seeing souls saved to the kingdom of God. That means... People are spending eternity in hell. Do you want to get God back in America? Where we can see. I mean, not, let, let's learn from the, 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 the great revivals. I, I'm a firm believer the second great awakening stalled out and stopped because God started dealing with these great pastors. History is beautiful. You need to study it so we can learn from it. God started speaking to a lot of these great well-known pastors about slave owners and, and them owning slaves and they would not respond and the revival started leveling out till it ended. And we've used up everything that that we can possibly pull from our founding fathers there's no more blessings to get from them we can't live on their coattails any longer are we willing to make the change he said some people I know have proposed to introduce extracts from the Bible to our schools instead of the Bible but the Bible is a cheap book and is to be had in every bookstore I've heard it proposed that a portion of the Bible should be read in every day by the master as a means of instructing children in it but this is a poor substitute for obliging children to read it as a school book for by this means we insensibly engrave as it were its contents upon their minds and it has been remarked that children instructed in this way in the scriptures seldom forget any part of it I want to put another little footnote in here be careful that you're substituting either commentary or devotions instead of the Bible. To the arguments I've mentioned in favor of the use of the Bible school book, I add a few reflections, and I'm just about done. The present fashionable practice of rejecting the Bible from our schools, I suspect, I suspect has originated with the deist. They discover great ingenuity in this new mode of attacking Christianity. So... I want to add this because Christianity is being attacked. If they proceed in it, they will do more in a half century hindering our religion than Voltaire or Bolingbroke could have effected in a thousand years. 
He says, I am not writing to these class of people. I, only, I wish only to alter the opinions and conduct of those lukewarm or superstitious Christians who have been misled by the deities on this subject. So we need to learn from that. Those that are bent on things are going to be this way. That just let them go. Let them go. Let the Bidens and the Harris and the ones, yes, pray for them, but let them go. You're not going to change their mind. But these folks that are hanging in the balance, that has to be our, our target audience. And surely our school kids has to be that target. In contemplating the political institutions of the United States, I lament that, now listen to this, that we waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them. Folks, it is unbelievable the amount of money we're spending on prisons. We profess to be Republicans, and I'm not talking about a party. I'm talking about a republic. And yet, we neglect the only means of establishing our republican forms of government. That is the universal education of our youth in the principles of Christianity by means of the Bible. For this divine book above all others favors that equality among mankind that respect for just laws and all those sober, sober and frugal virtues which constitute the soul of republicanism. You want God back in our nation, then we're going to have to do more than just pray. We're going to have to... We're going to have to see... The Word of God start being read again by our kids. If it can't be done in schools, then maybe we can do it in our child, in our daycares, in our home schools. But, but I'm going to tell you, and, and surely, surely, if, if your kids are in public school and we're not going to be able to get in our public schools, then you must start taking time at home and allowing your kids to read the Bible out loud. You hear what I said? Out loud. Not silently. Out loud. There, I'm going to tell you something. There is something to be said when you say it out loud. I have people come to my office a lot of times with problems. Sometimes it's ridiculous problems. When I mean ridiculous, it's kind of idiotic. Thankfully, it might not be any of you guys. Because I talk to more people with problems outside of this congregation than I ever do. In, there's not a comparison. First thing I have to do if I'm sitting there thinking that's the most idiotic thing I've ever heard under my breath, first thing I tell them to do is say that out loud. And they'll say it out loud, and they say, you know what, Pastor, when you say it out loud, except they don't say Pastor, when you say it out loud, it, that's really kind of foolish, isn't it? I said, there's, there's, there's power in hearing yourself say these things but it works both ways guys the thing that made America great the New England primer the word of God being read by our kids in school and it was encouraged by the parents this to be done people like Benjamin Franklin Benjamin Rush George Washington John Adams John Adams was an devout Christian man all these people they were products of a great awakening where God was moving in a miraculous way and people took the very things that they heard expounded on from the Word of God and began to put them to practice and they changed a nation. I'm going to end, but I want you to know, in 1620, when our, when, when our founders landed on 1620, the first two years, the first year half of them died. 
the second year half what was left died again they finally put together a form of government that caused them to prosper but even from that all the way up to the revolutionary war we had periods of time where we started seeing what would soon be America start start walking away from the precepts of God but thankfully somebody stood up in the middle of all this evil remember how we used to burn witches at the stake all of this evil. listen ladies many of you would be burned today for your essential oils I mean this was ludicrous stuff going on we, they were burning these women because they thought they were witches but there was a group of people that understood that this word of God is stronger than what we're living in it can change an entire nation and it did it did but it had to it, it, they had to do something out of the ordinary they had to go back to the very basic tenets and I'm going to tell you you know why we don't want to read the Bible in the school is because 90% or higher of the Christians do not believe in the basic tenets of Christianity any longer we don't believe that there's only one way to heaven that the Bible is inherent these, these very simple, basic tenets, less than 10% of Christians in America believe in the basic tenets. Well, I want, I want to give you some hope because only about 30% of the people in the Revolutionary War was even okay with the war and much less, probably less than 20%, actually was willing to stand up and fight. It doesn't take everyone and it surely doesn't take Washington, D.C. And it doesn't take Nashville, Tennessee. But what it does take, it does take Fentress County. And it does take Church of the Harvest. And it takes churches like us and Christians that are, that are, that are sick and tired of all the evil. And folks, if this is not what we just seen once again, if we're not willing to say, listen, we need to do something then we don't need to complain about what else is coming. At least let us go to our grave saying, I did something. I did something. I did what I thought God wanted me to do. There's no telling how much backlash I'll get for reading this at the pulpit during a church sermon. And if I had been thinking and hadn't realized so many people would have been out I probably would have waited for another week or two when more people would have been here the ridicule is going to come if you're going to stand for God it's coming if you've been standing for God you know what I'm talking about we want change it's going to take more than just praying about it let's bow our heads father we thank